Get ready to be ignited by the most inspiring personalities our continent has to offer. MTC's Masters of Success. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for this evening's Masters of Success presenter, Josie. Good evening, Namibia, and welcome back to the NTN. I'm very excited to have all of you here tonight. Are we ready to get the show on the road? That doesn't sound very optimistic, Namibia. Are we ready to hear from the most important woman in the country? Yes. That sounds much better. Now, first and foremost, give yourselves a round of applause for being very dedicated towards the Masters of Success series. Now, there was a lot of preparation that needed to be done for this specific interview. As you can see that this specific guest is one that is very important. But do not be surprised when you discover that there are surprise elements to her character as well. Tonight, she's getting a surprise, you're getting a surprise, and I feel like being Oprah because everybody's getting a surprise. <laughs> We have so much that we still need to talk about. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, in true Namibian fashion, let's give a standing ovation to the First Lady of the Democratic Republic of Namibia, Mrs. Monica Gengos. <laughs> You may be seated. <laughs> As you can see, they've all come out in numbers yes, to come and hear what it is you have to say. Firstly, I want to thank you for allowing me to do your first local interview. I get to brag about that. Thank you. Yes. Now, Ms. Monica, we, we're going to go straight into it. Or oh, do I call you Ms. Gengos, Ms. Monica, Madam First Lady? Which one do you prefer? I've got some protocol dictators, as my husband calls them. Uh -huh. And if they forgive me, call me Monica for today. Okay, I, I like that. <laughs> I wish I could ask you to call me Miss Josie, but then that's stretching it a bit. So we're going to start off with the very first question. I'm sure a lot of people are excited to find out, how has life been in the State House so far? <laughs> we're going straight into it, don't waste time. I see that. <laughs> It, um, I take it one day at a time. If, if you overthink certain things or you think too deeply in it, it can literally drive you crazy. So I take every single day at a time. As every single day at a time. That's good to hear. I mean, you don't want so to So life there is good. Life. Today has been excellent. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's dictating the interview, I'm telling you. So continuing. As we've seen growing up in life, as an adult, the things or the habits that we develop as young people determine what kind of principles we embody as we grow up, eventually dictating our career paths and so forth, and whether we find happiness all in all. What are some of the most important decisions that you've made? As a matter of fact, walk us all the way back to when you were just a young lady and talk us through some of the most important decisions you had to make that dictated who it is you became until this point where you're now Miss Monica Gengos, a.k.a. Monica, a.k.a. Presidential Bay. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't expect that one. <laughs> a.k.a. what? <laughs> it's your word. Literally, it was one of the things that popped up when I typed into Google, who is Monica Gengos? It was a Twitter handle that, or a twi tweet that you... Had uh, posted. Can can I take this issue up? I did yes. call him Presidential Bay, but what I what I don't <laughs> like, what I don't like is these Twitter instigators who then CC'd my husband. Uh -huh. So he asked me, "What is Presidential Bay?" And I'm like, "I don't know." <laughs> <laughs> but to answer your question, yes. um, if I have to take it all the way back, and I think I'm thinking about this for the first time, because how you raised. Um, and how money is treated around you is important. And I was raised in a diamond mining town called Orangimund. So there's two things that happened there. Um, the first thing is everybody assumes you are rich. 
when you are not. So you were already forced to try and act in a certain way. And so speak a certain English. That's right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so lots of assumptions happen. Because yeah. of the way you speak, people assume certain things about you. She must be arrogant. She thinks she's clever. Um, and I don't assume any of that about anybody who doesn't speak fluent English. So I don't appreciate people who assume the reverse. That's the first thing, or the second thing. The last one that I think really shaped me is that I literally saw people with standard six become overnight millionaires from stealing diamonds. I think that was original BE in Namibia, mm, yes. pre-independence BE. <laughs> and nobody felt guilty about it because you know the government didn't like black people, so if we steal diamonds that you are going to have, what's the big deal? But the lesson he taught me as a young child is I saw those overnight millionaires become poor. And I realized, but that's not how it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be a rags to riches to rag story. It's supposed to be a rags to riches story. So I never want to become wealthy and then become poor again. Yes. And the only way you can avoid that is by not being greedy and by having integrity in how you build your assets. Because what you build up honestly, nobody can actually take it away from you. And if they do, you can build it up again. So you must never... <laughs> So you must never build a base that somebody can take away from you. And that made me do two things. The first thing is I focused on making money away from government. Because I've got a big mouth sometimes. <laughs> and I was worried in my youth that I can say something that will offend people in government or somewhere else and it will be taken from me. So I didn't want to suck up to anybody for tenders, for any dodgy things, because that can land you in jail or it can land you humiliated, and I didn't want any of those. So I think those things really shaped me, but I think what shaped me the most was my parents. Because my mother also would lecture my father often, <laughs> don't go steal diamonds. So, and that taught me is, when we're talking about corruption now, the people who influence corruption the most are those around us. Yes. We all know people who we suspect to be corrupt. It could be our parents, it could be our friends. And we can see it. But we either encourage it because we benefit from it, or we say nothing because it's not our business and we love this person. We don't want consequences for them. Yes. But it's really the people around you who can encourage bad behavior. So we need to regulate ourselves in the space in which we love one another. Indeed. I just, I, I don't know, I need a moment to just breathe. <laughs> She's so calm. <laughs> it's insane, really it is, but we'll continue, we'll continue. Um, considering you've spoken about the principles that you've, you've learned to adopt that have um, steered you into being this phenomenal woman that you are, let's talk about societal vices, especially for a woman, considering the era that you grew up in. It's so easy for a woman to start off on course and then be derailed by one or the other societal evil. What are some of the societal evils that you've A, experienced, or B, have to completely steer clear of to ensure that you were never derailed from your path? There's so many. But I think the biggest, and it's not a vice, um, I think the biggest risk to your progress is normally yourself. Yes. Well, let me speak about myself. I think I was the biggest risk to my success. Um, I think if you don't control your mind um, and you allow your emotions to get the better of you in many situations, I think that's where we stand in our own way. So I think if there's something I consciously told myself, is not to stand in my own way. And at times I did. And I'm just lucky that it didn't have consequences on my career uh, because I was quite focused on my career. Um, so it's, it's yourself. And the other thing that I taught myself is um, to stay away from unreasonable people and unreasonable situations right. because they always produce unreasonable results. And you are in the middle of it, and you could be the victim. 
but because you are in this unreasonable situation, there really is a certain situation where there's no victim and there's no um, perpetrator. perpetrator. Yes. You are guilty for having put yourself in that position in the first place. So I try and stay away from unreasonable people, although some people say I'm unreasonable. So. <laughs> Just depends on who's been calling you as of late. It's my children. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, Madam First Lady, or Monica, like you said, I just feel like I'm disrespecting you because you know our guru. For today, it's fine. Okay, for today, it's fine. Um, Monica, you are an alumna of the law faculty, if I'm not mistaken. And yet, most of your portfolios seem to completely be non-related to the legal fraternity. She was in the think tank for the supper party. Not a lot of people can say they were in the think tank. Like, you need to be the thinking in the tank. <laughs> that, that's how deep it is. You know, managing director of stimulus um, equity as well, and so many other portfolios. Considering what it is you studied, did you find it difficult to penetrate the financial sector of the country when you decided to not practice law at all? No, actually not. Um, I think I'm not a proponent of people who believe that you can only become successful with a university qualification. I don't think that at all. I think I've seen enough successful people who don't have tertiary qualifications to know that that's not true. Yes. But what I do know is true, is that education teaches you to think in a certain way, particularly law. And I think it, te it taught me to think in a logical sequence. And that helped me. Yes. What I do in terms of private equity and, and all the things I do in the financial sector, the core of our transactions are legal agreements. So my, my legal degree has truly helped me in every single thing that I've done. But if I could go back, I will definitely, for the purposes of what I do now, I would have probably studied probably a BCom LLB. And I've bullied my one child <laughs> to study that, Elizabeth. Say no to bullying, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's, a, it's a diverse qualification, and I think you, you must lend yourself for diversity. Another question that was prominently asked, or one of the questions that were prominently asked on, on social media was, and, and people ask me this question all the time, yeah. how did you study law but you're doing something completely different? So perhaps you can answer this question on behalf of myself and everybody else who can't answer the question. Do your academic qualifications necessarily determine what career path you choose at the end? No, your dreams do. So if you're studying, and I'm not going to look at her because she'll know I'm talking about her, but if you're studying, what can it be, accounting, <laughs> and your love is actually fashion design, I think there's no shame in changing that. Yes. And if your qualification is accounting, but your passion is interior decorating, then that's what you should do, because life is actually so short, and you cannot waste it by doing something you do not want to do. Mm -hmm. I hope that suffices. Still so many more questions to come. You're going to get so annoyed by me, but <laughs> since I can call you Monica, it's fine, right? So moving along, a lot of people think that you've had to sacrifice majority of your work in the financial sector because you became the first lady. Are they correct? They are correct, um, to an extent. There has been a financial sacrifice, and this might sound strange, but you work, f from a certain age, you work hard to make money. And then at a certain point, you should get to that point where you say, I've got enough of that now. What is it that I'm missing in my life? Yes. So there came a point in my life where I thought to myself, I've actually got enough. Um, what is it that I'm missing? And what I was missing was somebody who understood me. So financially, yes, but life-wise, no. I, was, I thought you were going to say, I thought you were going to say the state house was missing. That I, I, was, I was really hoping that would be the answer. It's a nice house. By the way, I did a survey and your home is the third, it's the fourth best state house in Africa. It's your home. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Our last question before we take a breather. 
Considering the fact that gender equality has been at the forefront of majority of, of, of the fights that, as a society, we have been facing recently, some institutions have taken it upon themselves to fast-track women in order to make sure that there is that 50-50 representation. What is your opinion on fast-tracking women into leadership positions, most specifically when they are not necessarily equipped for the position? I know, my question game's on fleek. <laughs> It's not, a, it's not an easy question. Um, my concern, as it is with 50-50, is about quality female leadership. Um, and fast-tracking, and, and let's take this away quickly from women. Yes. And just saying, let's talk about even black people. We need to be in more leadership positions in the private sector, in real leadership positions. Yes. Um, but when you fast-track anybody, I think there's a certain process that you need to follow. There's a certain level of maturity that you need. There's a certain understanding of how to deal with conflict that only comes with time and with maturity. We had a lot of leaders at independence who, because there were no black people in management, either at parastatals, in government, or in the private sector, who were literally parachuted in from the top yes. and had to learn on the go. And I think many of them did very well. But there's a new generation. And this new generation is working its way from the bottom. They start as clerks, they study their way, they become an officer, then a manager, then an area manager, and then a senior manager, then they get stuck there. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of talent right now, stuck at senior management level. And people aren't moving, so they're stuck and they're getting frustrated. So I don't know if we need to fast track talent, female or black, yes. or we need to identify the talent that's stuck in, the, in this bottleneck. There's a lot of amazing people that I know, and I wish for them that they get the opportunities. If Inge leaves Namdeb, that's a wonderful thing, because we get to now find somebody else to play that role. She's been there long enough. I think she's made her mark. She's done exceptional work there. Yes. But we must change the leadership um, faces. So I think this is an opportunity for new blood to come in. Mm -hmm. So it's not fast tracking, it's identifying. Okay. Now I, start, I started a trend with my previous Masters of Successes and unfortunately I'm going to bully you into this one. I know I said say no to bullying but this kind <laughs> of bullying is healthy. Okay. So just so that everybody can feel like they, they, they're welcome. And I just want to see how tax savvy you are. We're going to take a selfie really quickly <laughs> with everybody else. I, I don't know. Did all oh, there it is. So what must I do? Must yeah, I okay, close? so you're going to press that side. <laughs> but now you guys, please look photogenic. This picture is going everywhere. Okay, but we have to make sure you're in. Yes. Smile. <laughs> Oh, I, I keep, I'm holding it, sorry. Is yes, there we have it. A round of applause for our first lady. <laughs> Thank you very much for giving me my first presidential selfie. <laughs> yes. Now, just in case you're wondering, there's still so much more excitement to come up. I have a little bit of a surprise later on. We get to see some very cool things that the first lady has been up to. And don't forget, tonight we will shock the first lady with what it is we have in store for her. Don't be afraid just yet. <laughs> but for now, let's take a quick breather. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting our way. <laughs> A song of note, come jam with us and move to the groove. Gather everyone you know, our way is here, now here we go. Let's go. Super kick, try and go ahead, oh yeah. Grab your phone and let your fingers move. Here, there, everywhere, can't get enough, our way. A whole lot of texting on my right. I press and even in the night Making calls, chatting all the time So I keep the honeys on my side Head full of data for my treats So much more to set my beats My own choice to set the flow Everything to keep me on the go Oh, 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 oh,
This is your Masters of Success edition brought to you by MTC with NBC, NTN and the Namibian Sun. Let's have a round of applause for our sponsors. <laughs> Monica, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me to the State House last week, Friday morning. It was wonderful. The food was amazing. I think food just generally tastes better if it's in hours blink. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. But something that struck me is the humility that you presented, especially when thanking the founding first lady and the former first lady for their contributions and, and, yeah, and their work at the office of the first lady. There was a picture that we retrieved that was taken um, last week, Friday, where you're all seated. It's, I think this picture tells such a big story. And literally, it is a representation of the generations of First Lady Namibia has had, and still has. We'll just add someone else next time to show the future. <laughs> Don't worry, in 15 years. But looking at this picture, most of us have a general idea of what it is Madam Nuyoma represented as a First Lady, what it is Madam Pohamba represented as a First Lady. What would you like Monica Gengos, First Lady of Namibia, the persona itself to represent? Change. Yeah. I think the role of First Lady, we, we speak so often about the changing role of women in our society, but it's as if the First Lady and that role has been excluded from this change. Yes. So the First Lady is very much expected to be the wife who supports the husband, who doesn't work, and who looks pretty every day. <laughs> now, I do work part-time. I don't look pretty every day. <laughs> I find it hard to believe. No, 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 I don't believe me. <laughs> um, and I think it's, it's, it's really a reflection um, of where our society is going to. Um, there's an organization called the Organization of African First Ladies, yes. which is doing exceptional work when it comes to HIV um, and cancer-related issues. But I've got such a problem with the title, Organization of African First Ladies, because it's almost as if we've accepted that it will be forever a boys' club running Africa, and the wives are at this Organization of African First Ladies. <laughs> Let me put up my hand first and say to those suspecting me, I do not want to become president at all. Okay, I'm happy that was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy with being the wife I am, but I'm not happy with an assumption that women cannot become president. So I think we will have, we will have a female president in my lifetime, and then we will need to review this role of first lady. And rename it. And rename it, okay. I hope I can be part of the committee that gives suggestions. <laughs> Speaking of you as First Lady, what will your primary focus be during your tenure? My role is really, I'm, I'm First Lady because I married Hage, if I may call him Hage. I made the mistake already, so I might as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he is very sincere about this poverty eradication, poverty alleviation. Um, fortunately for me, I've got certain skills when it comes to entrepreneurship. So what I'd like to do is also look at issues around poverty and its manifestations. Um, my focus will be on many things, youth entrepreneurship, um, trying to see businesses that are operating in townships, because at the moment it's hair salons, it's car washes, um, what Bars, else? Bottle stores, what else? So w we must, and the, but there's other entrepreneurs in townships, but they're staying small yes. in rural areas, and we must help them to grow bigger, to be part of this big economy um, that is invented. So what, what I want to do is and even if I just manage to do it with 10 people, then I've succeeded, but I want to break that poverty cycle. We cannot allow a child to be born in poverty, die in poverty, and have their children bo be born and die in poverty. 
so I'm looking and, and I'm, so I'm looking at breaking this generational poverty cycle um, and in many different ways. At times it will be charity related work of giving. At times it will be around education, particularly early childhood education. Yes. It will be around entrepreneurship, particularly youth entrepreneurship. Yes. It will be around diseases, communicable and non-communicable diseases, things like HIV, things like um, cancers. And then it will also be around our psyche. I think um, poverty is a vicious state of mind in addition to being a vicious way to live. Yes. And we, it, it manifests itself in self-destructive behavior. When I see the statistics on teenage pregnancies, it breaks my heart because it's young people making choices that has got economic consequences for them and their unborn child. Not only the risk of HIV, but it's difficult to escape poverty when you have another mouth to feed. And this is a topic I think I'm passionate about because I had my son when I was 19 years old. I think he's here. Nina. Hi. He's a, he's a strapping, handsome, stable young man now. I can see. Oh, he knows it. But the reality is if my parents didn't provide a support system for me, my mother, her sister, Mefirita, my father, these people provided a net for me to fall into yes. and lift me up again. But there's children who don't have that net and they fall mm. because I could have fallen. It was an absolute own goal. It was a combination of ignorance, a combination of everything that is silly. And it was my own fault. I had nobody to blame. But it had the potential to really, totally destroy my future and prevent me from being where I am today. And I'd like to help young people not to make that mistake because it's an unnecessary, self-inflicted mistake that has got long-term consequences. I am lucky, but others are not. Indeed. They actually brought to life the phrase mother of the nation, literally wanting to become the mother of all the citizens in your very big nation. Just don't ask for handouts. It's not, it's not cool. We continue, Monica. And something that struck me about you is the fact that you are very active on social media for a first lady. You tweet more than I tweet Facebook and <laughs> Instagram. <laughs> Literally. So, unless, of course, you're telling us those aren't your tweets, which will be very disappointing. They are my tweets. <laughs> so, she said they are her tweets. How do you manage to be gutsy enough to open up yourself to communicate with people and at the same time steer clear or manage to successfully avoid or address criticism by faceless individuals? It's hypocrisy to say, don't be on social media so you don't get attacked. Look, you, I get attacked in people's living rooms all the time. I just don't hear about it. Oh. <laughs> so if somebody attacks me on social media, it's okay. Then at least I know what they're saying. And it happens. Yes. But as in life, I think you'll always be gossiped about. You'll always be attacked. There'll always be somebody who has something to say about you. Some good, some bad. But normally there's more positive than negative. Yes. My, my experience of social media has been an exceptionally positive one. I love the people I engage on social media. And it also taught me in life, you get back what you give out. So I'm not there being negative, attacking people, so why should I be attacked? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm okay with it. That's the first thing. The second thing is I don't want this polished image of perfection because it's not me. Yes. I am going to make mistakes, I am going to speak too much, I am going to say something that upsets people and they'll be up in arms. And I think all of you must walk that path with me as I make these mistakes. Because I'm a reflection of you. What I do well, many of you do well. What I do wrong, you do wrong as well. And I think it's important at this point, society has evolved. Yes. Um, this thing of having leaders who say one thing here and do another thing there, 
it's becoming difficult because the space to hide has been reduced. Yes. You can be taped, you can be, somebody can record you and put it on social media. So you must be true to who you are. And I want to be true to who I am. Um, and maybe, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Okay. <laughs> stop yourself immediately. <laughs> While we're on social media questions, what um, are some of the personal, sac personal and social sacrifices that you've had to make since going into the State House as First Lady? I think it would be unfair for me to detail those because this was a choice I made. Yes. So I knew it was going to happen. So there are sacrifices, it's true. But there's also privileges, and it would be unfair to lament the sacrifices and not, and, and not acknowledge the privileges okay. that come with it. Okay. So I think if I'm going to talk about a sacrifice that makes me feel bad, is the sacrifice that those around us have to make, the price they pay, um, because the benefits stop with myself and my husband. Yes. They don't see or get those benefits. Yet there's expectation on them as well. Often they'll get lectures as family members, as close friends. Please don't go speak unnecessary things. Please don't go to the nightclub and come out late. Something may go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and then it will be a problem because of, of, of the connections. Yes. Please don't engage in business that will bring us problems. Please don't do this. Please don't do this. Please don't do this. So there's so many limitations in terms of who they can be and, and they're making a sacrifice for us to be where we are and that makes me feel bad. And every time I see an article about the husband of the minister or the daughter of the president, or it makes me feel bad because they didn't choose that. Yet society holds them accountable for where we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a sacrifice. Perhaps before we continue, you might as well just mention a privilege because I can see the aura in the room just dropped. The biggest privilege or the nicest privilege what? of being in the state house, the nice besides food? the nice food. What is it? My husband? He <laughs> doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't count. He's. He's already mandatory. He, he, he doesn't count. What is it? It's not fair. We want something we don't know. You're really terrible, really. You, you're asking me <laughs> hard questions. What, what is it? I was about to say that I don't have to cook, but I'm used to cooking. <laughs> Look, my life hasn't really changed that much, okay. to be honest. Um, a lot has changed. Blah. Yeah, I mean, your husband's just the most powerful man what in is the, the country, nice, yeah. but it's not, you know. It's <laughs> no, not. It's, it's, it's actually him. I've never been married before. Okay. Um, it actually really is him, because uh -huh. we've had to, we don't get, you know, I'm, I'm seeing family members and friends in this audience who I haven't seen in a long time because of this issue. Um, so him and I have had to become a team. Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've really had to become exceptionally close. We've really had to understand each other quickly. Um, because I think what people forget, they're talking about 100 days of being president. Well, it's about 100, well, I haven't counted, but it's about 120 days of being married as well. So <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're nearly wed. And yes. we saw, we, we, we're solidifying that yeah. bond. So I think if, that's all I see when I think of State House. Brilliant, it's mm. still a beautiful picture that you're painting. Before we take another breather, you were speaking earlier about your kids. And I can guarantee you, I'm guessing I can guarantee that raising children in a state house is not easy. How do you manage, how do you and your husband both manage to keep your children grounded despite the fact that they have at their disposal things and privileges that most Namibians don't? They've all fled. <laughs> oh, we've only got one okay. who's staying there and I'm trying to make them feel guilty. The reality is that our children are well raised. Um, obviously, we've had to integrate two families, but it's the most amazing children on both sides. Yes. Um, my husband has a wonderful heart, and his children have his heart. 
I have a wonderful heart. <laughs> and my children have my heart. So I don't think the children are really going to say they've got a lot of privileges because we are tough on them. Okay. Um, they've got a lot of restrictions. Um, and we don't allow them to do just anything. And I don't want to tell you the stories with money and children. Yes. Um, to the extent where I tell them all the time, and I'm very serious, I owe them an education. And I can maybe help with a car, and I can maybe help with a place to stay. But many people don't have that. Many children don't have that. Yes. So once a parent does that for you, they've done more than enough. They're not going to inherit much for me. So I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to finish my money. <laughs> because it's my money. Yes. So these children who say, Mommy, my friends say, I'm rich. I was like, Ella, you're not rich. <laughs> you don't have any money. <laughs> it's your money. But on a serious issue, I think the problem with uh, poverty is exactly this. There are certain children who inherit they haven't done anything for this money. And so wealth stays roundabout in the same place. It doesn't circulate. Yes. I'm a proponent of a wealth tax. <coughs> I think people who have more must give more. And it shouldn't be reliant on me, on me deciding, OK, I feel bad. Let me give a little check here. It should be more structured. I think there should be a tax. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I think there should be a tax, and I do think, from a personal perspective, I can't speak to others, but what I'll personally do in my own will, I will identify an issue that will be in my will. And I don't respect any person who loves animals and leaves a portion of their will to the SBCA, wonderful. Mm -hmm. But I do think there's people who are suffering, and I do think there is a portion of what I have when I pass. I do want it to go further than my family. And, and that is something I'll personally do, because we must give back in a structured way, not yes. when we feel like it. Okay. That's very impressive. I, I can't say the same. I don't have my millions yet. <laughs> but we'll get there. We'll get there. Finally, Madam First Lady, regarding the office of the First Lady, the President is ideally or realistically responsible for the country in its entirety. And as the First Lady, you are the closest to him at most times. How do you intend for your role as First Lady to affect and support him while he leads our country into prosperity? By being a good wife. The next question is, how does one become a good wife? <laughs> I'm trying, I know what you're trying to ask. <laughs> Hage has been a leader since the age of 20, when he left this country. He was in exile for 27 years. Yes. So from being a 20-year-old, he was a leader. And you all know the difference in age. So I don't know if I have the ability to enrich his leadership capacity. Yes. He was elected because he's been such a historical, uh, such a good leader historically. So I think I need to allow him to be the excellent leader that he is and make sure that in his personal space, he's happy. Yes. Because that allows him to be and do what he needs to do for this country. I still didn't get the tips that I was looking for, but I'll settle for that. For now. <laughs> for now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, do not worry. The fun still continues. There's still so much more inspiration that's to come. But for now, once again, let's take a quick breather. Looking for a new car, sir? Yes, I am, actually. Great. Are you looking for something fuel economy or sporty? Petrol, diesel, hybrid, front or rear wheel drive, color, make, model? Well, what I think I'm looking for is something oh, like luxury sedans, SUVs, coupes, hatchbacks. Maybe something. No, 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 wait! Don't tell me. I know. <sighs> yeah. MTC understands that too much choice can be overwhelming, so we simplified our packages to offer you the best in voice, data, and SMS. 
You see, the, the audience never claps hands this much for me. So thank you once again for coming, Monica. Now, the Masters of Success program is developed by MTC and geared towards creating some sort of aura of inspiration into our country. We need a new wave of inspiration, especially in these dire times when we're gearing up to fight against poverty. And we're more than happy to have our very first Namibian guest on our show tonight, and who none other is the um, First Lady of the Democratic Republic of Namibia. Such a long name, so I'll stick to Monica. Oh, sorry, by the way, yes. uh -huh. my husband says it's not the Democratic Republic of Namibia. It's, it's the, Republic the Republic of Namibia. Namibia. Okay. No, I just, I always say Democratic Republic because when I did something wrong as a child, my mother would always say, my house is not a democracy. <laughs> so, but I'll, I'll remember that now. Let's talk money. I'm sure a majority of the people are here because they trust you can make money and so we want to hear how it is we can make money. Now, you are not only worth one or two or ten, you're worth approximately $60 million dollars. And you make it seem so easy to make money. Most Namibians can't even keep their paycheck for 20 days. <laughs> in, terms, in terms of financial education, there's certain principles that one adopts in order to be ensured that your methods of making money, but most importantly, keeping money, are in sync with one another. What is the advice that you would give Namibians regarding making and saving money? Can I just quickly talk about the 60 million? Okay. Um, I'm 38. 30, I'm 38. Sorry, I'm not pretending. I don't know how old I am. I, I'm always stuck between 37, 38, or 39. I'm 38. My husband is 73. So you will appreciate. He started working a long time ago, and he's accumulated, accumulated, accumulated. And so what he's done now at his age is he has to de-risk what he has. Yes. So he sold his only main asset, his, his only asset, which is property, his only real asset. So he cashed that. So it's in cash at the moment because of where he is in his life cycle. Because an investment cycle really follows your age. I can take a little bit more risk because I'm 38 years old. So I can stomach a problem in one of the companies where I am. I'll recover from it because I've got time. I cannot be in cash at the moment. So I don't have 60 million cash. Okay. I've got 60 million worth. I've got assets that can be worth 60 million, but they can also collapse tomorrow and then I'm worth nothing. So I'm at a high risk time of my investment cycle. Yes. So I do have cash flow issues like everybody else does. I do have to save, I do have to budget, I do have to be careful with my money. But there are times there'll be a bonus, there'll be a dividend check, and then I can splash on something nice for myself. I can help people around me. I can do nice things, but the assets are really still at a risk phase. And it can change. It can go up or it can go down. So I just wanted to explain that issue quickly. What was your question again? Oh, okay. <laughs> I was so lost into that answer, I almost forgot my own question. The question is regarding um, formal financial education and generally principles one needs to adopt in order to make sure that, mm -hmm. you know, your, your earnings and your savings are in tune with each other. I remember when I was still advising doing corporate finance, one of our clients was listing on the Namibian Stock Exchange. And we traveled throughout South Africa and throughout Namibia um, to convince people to buy these shares. And we were in Ongwediva. And I remember so clearly sitting, listening to the questions that people had to ask, and almost being shocked, because the day before we were in Vintuk, and it was a group of highly educated Namibians, lawyers, doctors, engineers, you name it. And they were asking the same questions we were being asked in Ongwediva. So financial education has got nothing to do with your qualification on where you are in life. Yes. It's got everything to do with not allowing somebody else to take control of your finances. There's too many people sitting here who've got unnecessary insurance policies, too many people sitting here with unnecessary debt, too many people sitting here who are allowing lifestyle expenses to get in the way of building assets. So if you get into debt because you want to fund your education, that's good debt. Okay. 
But if you get into debt because you want a pair of these shoes, that's very, very bad debt. I have very bad debt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think it's, 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 it's managing lifestyle pressures. Um, and I think many people, once they've studied or once they reach, you know, let me tell you a secret. Um, there was a time in my career where I had an exceptional, exceptional public profile. Really, I had a strong public profile. Oh, yes. But I really didn't have money. The money came later. So I built a profile first and then I made money. So often you start thinking, you know, Monica, you're a whole listings manager at the NSX. You can't be driving this crusty old little polo that you're driving. People expect better. Yes. And the minute you start talking to yourself like that, you're going to destroy yourself. Because it's not what people expect you to drive, it's what you can afford to drive. Yes. I'm just thinking about all the wrong financial decisions I've been making so far. I have a long way to go. While we're on formal financial education, obviously saving is a habit that needs to start at a very young age. From the inst or for an instance, at a time when a child is already getting pocket money, that's a great platform for one to start, you know, practicing a little bit on how to save. I see mother and daughter had a little moment there. So I'll just, I'll get in on that later on. Advice on what it is as young people, the, the mindset that we need to adopt in terms of dealing with money specifically. Don't let your ego determine your expenses. I've seen lots of young people in an environment where you can literally see they're making the wrong financial decision because they're surrounded by people. This could be in a nightclub where you say, drinks on me. <laughs> it could be in a restaurant, it could be in a shop. I mean, I once bought an exceptionally expensive jacket just because the girl who had to help me was being rude and I wanted to show her I can afford this jacket. <laughs> And I went around the corner and I thought, my goodness, you can't afford this jacket and you want to prove something to somebody you don't know, take that damn thing back. Yes. So I swallowed my pride and I took that jacket back. But that was an ego purchase. I wanted to prove something to this person who was being rude to me. So please, don't allow your ego to make your financial decisions. Yeah. And have a plan. Have a plan for your life. Businesses need to have business plans. They need to know their cash flow. They need to know the opportunities, their strengths, their weaknesses. Now, if your weakness is you need to have an art qualification to become a great artist. You need to save for that. You need to make that part of your life plan and get that qualification, but that takes money. So if I need to get a different job, if I need to save more, if I need to cut expenses, if I need to change my group of friends. So you must have a plan in terms of what you want to achieve, yes. and then you decide how you want to go about that, and your money must be in sync with that. Because a lot of people are stuck in jobs they do not like because they can't afford to leave. Okay, I hope you guys are writing these things down. Eh? It's the only opportunity you're going to get. Our final question for this segment, or, or rather or regarding this topic of money, there is a ministry that has been created um, and its mandate is geared towards fighting poverty. Now, currently, we have this looming, ticking time bomb known as land. Mass housing is now apparently referred to as mess housing. So as a first lady, but also as someone who's financially conscious and, and, and conscious about societal evils and how we can address them, in your opinion, where did we go wrong, especially when dealing with issues such as, as, as land and housing and, and you know, the provision for basic um, necessities for the average Namibian person? And how can we turn that around to get back on the right track? I've had, I've had the privilege of traveling and looking at countries in the Western Hemisphere, but also other African countries. And this issue of land, these issues of inequality, um, of all these things we're grappling with are global problems. So Namibia has done exceptionally well on the issue of poverty. And so right. I just want to make that very clear. We've, list, we've lifted 400,000 people out of poverty since independence. When I came here and I saw your cars, I was shocked because I think there's as many cars outside as there are people inside. Now, there was a time when I was young 
there'd be a party of 50 people inside, but there's like two cars outside. <laughs> and now there's 50 cars outside and 50 people inside. We have seen a huge surge of people entering this economy, particularly black people. Okay. I know that there was a time that the streets out of Vintuk were only full at the end of the month when people had money. These days, those roads are full every day. Where is this money coming from? Where, are, where is the money coming from that people can use to build houses? Yes, we have a problem with poverty. Yes, we have a problem with income redistribution. But this country has done so many things right that I can't get it in my heart to agree that we've gone wrong. That's the first thing. Okay. The second thing is, I think, is where has this world gone wrong? Why do we have so much resources, yet such poor distribution of those resources? And that's a question we'll need to ask ourselves. And then in this country, where it gets complicated, and that's why we have to have this, this ministry. Poverty is structural. Yes. And we need a structural approach to changing that. Because a lot of people, it's not their choice to be poor. It's the lack of access to quality education, health care, all of these things perpetuate and entrench poverty. It's the lack of decent jobs. Um, we're moving towards a much more sophisticated economy, but the jobs that are needed is really for blue collar work. So we've got serious challenges from an economy perspective that we need to, uh, to resolve before we can get people out of poverty. Because the only way you can get people out of poverty is to provide them with jobs. And that is what we're struggling with. Yeah. Um, it's, it's providing employment, it's creating businesses, and it's redistributing wealth fairly. So I think it's not land. We're making noise about land, but, and it's, a, it's, a, it's important noise. We must hear that. But that's not the only problem that we have mm -hmm. and that we're facing. So I think we've got a lot of fires to fight on a lot of issues, education, land, um, health care and all of these fires are being fought at the same so if we are going to now leave all of these fires and run quickly and address this fire here those other fires start to get bigger and bigger yes. so it's a parallel process it's a concurrent effort that is being undertaken to fight many of these challenges and that's why I'm wary of too much noise on what issue because there are so many issues but I'm not criticizing the noise because it's necessary. Yes. We must hear these things. They are real and we agree. Lots of people have that challenge and nobody is disagreeing that land is a problem. Mm -hmm. If I may critique, land has been, been, has been made available. It's the pace. At no, which number it becomes one. accessible, All right. And then, so that's the process issue. The second issue on the people side is there's been an element of greed in how this land that has been distributed has been distributed. And we need to get the processes and the people issues right. And we'll have a solution. And then just the ability to move faster. And I think every single indication that I've seen from this government is that there's a clear and direct focus to do that. And I fall in love with a, minister, with a minister of urban planning every single day because she is identifying exactly where the problems are. And we must give her time to resolve these issues. Indeed, after all they do say, patience is a virtue. So we'll just have to wait and see. And I'm sure we'll be seeing great results. We have faith in the current government, do we not? Yes. That didn't sound very optimistic. <laughs> We'll see at the end of this interview whether we have faith in the current government or not. Now, on the other side of this, we are going to have fun. But not Monica's idea of fun, my idea of fun. Stay tuned. Young women, when getting married, have this vivid imagination of this vivid idea of walking down the aisle 
in a white dress. <laughs> but not Monica. <laughs> Take a look at what she on 14th of February 2015. You stunned everybody. And we were so surprised because a lot of people thought, is she going to wear very wang? What is she going to wear? And then boom. You were dressed like that. I must add, it's a brilliant dress. What made you choose to go the traditional route as opposed to, to, to choosing a white gown for your wedding day? You know, talking of marriage, today's the 30th of June, and my parents are sitting in this audience, and they've been married for 46 years today. I take the institution of marriage very seriously. It wasn't an easy decision, particularly because of who I chose to marry. Ooh, this is where the oversharing is going to start, and I'm going to be <laughs> criticized for I'm it. I'm just so ready and eager. Let me get back to your question yes. about the wedding dress. So, <laughs> with the wedding dress, it was actually a natural decision. Um, I think... I don't have anything to prove to anybody. So I don't need to wear the most expensive wedding dress. Yes. I didn't need to have the most expensive wedding. I think we spent, we, we spent a reasonable amount, but I, I definitely think we spent less than many marriages or wedding ceremonies that I've seen. Not because we don't take our wedding seriously. That's just a ceremony for one day. We take our marriage seriously. Yes. And that's where we invested our time and energy. So the money part became irrelevant. So it became more about what is it that's going to make me feel beautiful? How is it I denied my parents the wedding they wanted in the north with all their relatives frustrating me? And <laughs> <laughs> so I denied them that. But So I thought the least I can do to make it up for them is to wear something that celebrates where I come from. It's a beautiful dress. I can guarantee you, after, after your wedding ceremony, there were a couple of renditions of your dress that showed up on Facebook. However, those renditions were... Yes, let's carry on. <laughs> Now, there have been many things that have been said about you since you've become first lady. But I'm sure there's that one thing that's been said about you that just ticks you off. What is it? And please feel free to set the record straight. I think there's two things that tick me off. <laughs> Let me address the one that relates to me. I mean, people who know me very well know that I'm not focused on my appearance that much. I don't have time. It takes a long time to do hair, makeup, and nails. Really, I don't have time. Yes. So I buy things for them to last, quality things that may cost a little bit of money, but they're meant to last because I don't have time to wander around in shops. And this is before First Lady stuff. And I was outraged, quite honestly, when somebody saw me wearing a pair of heels and saying, oh, but she's worn those before. <laughs> And I thought, the cheek, I'm going to wear those shoes until they are old and leaning like this. I'll wear them every day if I have to. Yeah. <laughs> but generally, in terms of what people say, I've got a relatively thick skin, to be honest. Um, and I can absorb a lot of criticism. And I, because I don't also assume all the criticism is because somebody hates me. Yes. Sometimes I deserve it. Um, sometimes it's true. A lot of the time it's not true, it's not fair, but I'm not going to be sitting there thinking, oh, this is so unfair, oh, this is not true, because I'm, I'm taking away energy from myself. So the comments around me that burn, it's normally when I'm having a weak day. You've got this armor every single day and you're absorbing so many arrows, and then one day something happens to that armor and it just opens a little bit. And somebody just says a small thing, like, oh, you look nice today. What do you mean? Yes. Don't I always look nice? But you're so sensitive about this comment. Yeah. And it's not that comment that is making me sensitive. It's just all these comments all the time. So nothing, so there isn't...